Welcome to the penultimate IIPP event, IIPP Public Purpose in the Time of COVID-19 event. Uh, today we're going to be talking about jobs and employment, rethinking employment. Uh, a very good time to be doing this given the world is currently experiencing uh, one of the biggest shocks to employment in history. Uh, we're hearing about various schemes across the world for how to get people back into work, including here in the UK, where the policy seems to be very much about nudging uh, employers and households back into the shops um, and, and selling, selling, opening up um, with financial incentives of various kinds. But there is a more radical approach to the problem of unemployment. And that's what we'll be discussing today. The job guarantee uh, program, the job guarantee proposal, which has been around for a long time, but is I think now reaching a level of uh, interest that perhaps we haven't seen for many decades, at least, in, uh, uh, at least since the uh, post uh, World War II period. And um, there is a consensus, I think, even before the pandemic kicked in, that the standard assumption that there was a trade-off between having uh, full employment and inflation, i.e. that there would be a danger of rising inflation if everyone has a job, i.e. that you need some level of unemployment, that that consensus is breaking down because, of course, for the last decade since the financial crisis of 2008, we've had low inflation despite relatively high levels of employment up until the pandemic. So some questions being asked about that uh, assumption. So I'm delighted uh, today to have joined me three experts on this topic. I'm joined by uh, Pavlina Cherneva, who is uh, Associate Professor of uh, Economics at Bard College. Uh, she's an American uh, in New York, that is. So she's an American economist, specialist in modern monetary theory and public policy. And she's just published this book, The Case for a Job Guarantee, which uh, comes highly recommended by me and other members of the panel, of the panel I believe. Um, it's actually very short, uh, just uh, 150 pages, a really great introduction uh, to the, the topic. And um, Pavlina has been uh, really ramping up interest in this through her academic research for, for many years. She's published a number of papers on the topic at uh, at the Levy uh, Economics Institute, which is one of the foremost institutions uh, pushing this, this concept. Uh, previously, she was a visiting scholar at the University of Cambridge, um, where she developed an interpretation of Keynes's approach to full employment, uh, which was recognized with a, 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 the Helen Potter Prize. As I said, she's a research scholar now at the Levy Economics Institute, as well as heading up their economics program um, and she's worked with policymakers across the world on employment, designing employment programs and also speaks at central banks on mon modern monetary theory and, and uh, macroeconomic stabilization policy. And she also worked on Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign. So welcome, Pavlina. Also joining me is uh, Robert Skidelsky. Robert is Professor Emeritus of Political Economy at the University of Warwick and is also a member of the House of Lords. He's one of uh, Britain's foremost economic historians and his specialist expertise is the historic role of fiscal policy in advanced economies and the rise and fall and return of Keynesian economics. He's, most, he's best known for uh, the authorship of three books constituting a biography of Keynes, which has won five literary prizes, Return of the Master, uh, but his most recent book, Money and Government, a Challenge to Mainstream Economics, uh, I would also recommend highly, uh, it makes the case for putting theories of money and government at the centre of the field. He's made a life peer of the House of Lords in 1991, and he's also been uh, trying to in increase the public understanding of economics through work uh, in partnership with the Institute of New Economic Thinking. Finally, we have uh, Arore Laluc, who is a uh, uh, member of the European Parliament, French economist and politician. Um, 
who was elected in 2019. She's been a strong voice for the European Green New Deal agenda and for the adoption of new wealth indicators which factor in social environmental concerns. And within the parliament, she serves on the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs and the Delegation for Relations with the United Nations. She's also a member of the European Parliament Intergroup on LGBT Rights and Responsible Business Conduct Working Group. She's the author of several books, including Faut il donner un prix de la nature? Should we give a price to nature? With Jean Guédre, which won the 2015 uh, book prize of the Fondation d'Ecologie Politique. And she co-founded the think tank Institute Verblin with the aim of producing ideas to put the economy at the service of ecological and social goals. So welcome, Aurore. So fantastic panel. Um, I am uh, Head of uh, Finance and Macroeconomics at the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose. Josh Ryan Collins, my name. And um, without further ado, I will first hand over to Pavlina uh, to give us a, a sort of 10 minute introduction to the idea of a, a job guarantee scheme. And the format then is I will ask Robert and Aurore to make uh, sort of short responses to that, uh, give their perspective, and then we'll have a series of questions and answers and at around about uh, 10 past five, uh, I'll open up to uh, Q and A uh, from the floor. So please prepare your, your questions and feel free to put questions in the chat as the speakers are speaking because uh, we'll be making a note of the, of the best questions and I'll, I'll be asking those to the, to the panelists once we finish this initial uh, section. Uh, so thanks very much, Pavlina. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Josh, and thank you to the IIPP for, uh, for the invitation for this event. I thought um, I would start talking a little bit about uh, epidemiology just to frame the question. Um, when we, in the midst of COVID, you know, when we think about epidemiology, the bread and butter of that discipline is preparedness and prevention. Right? Preparedness and prevention. And we see how important it is when we have to respond to a crisis to have um, know-how, to have systems that are able to address to a viral outbreak, to have research and do everything possible to prevent the outbreak. Now, in economics, the one macroeconomic condition that resembles an epidemic is an epidemic is actually unemployment. And unemployment um, behaves very much like a viral outbreak uh, from the way it spreads to the kind of costs that it inflicts on, on people, on communities, on the economy, as well as to the lasting impact. And so I would like to make that case that we should be thinking in very similar ways uh, as epidemiologists, that we need to be thinking about ways of preventing mitigation, preparedness, and have the agility to respond to mass unemployment. Now, in fact, in economics, we don't, we don't do that terribly well. We seem to respond to crises. You know, we, we see mass layoffs, um, as a consequence of financial crisis, as a consequence of well, COVID, it could be just the regular heartbeat of the economy, just the regular business cycle, but also it, unemployment is also a perennial feature of, of the economy. And we, we even have a, a name for it, we call it natural. But that's really, uh, there's really nothing natural about uh, unemployment. And in the sense, we can argue that unemployment is not um, is not inevitable. So we, we intervene, usually, you know, after great outbreaks, mass unemployment, always too late, too little, too late. And, you know, the casualty uh, is, the casualties are, are many. And so the job guarantee really is a, is a program of, I would say, prevention, uh, even inoculation uh, that prevents some of the social costs of unemployment, but also it's a very important structural uh, program for for in the macroeconomic toolkit. So I'll spend the next few minutes um, arguing that actually it's a, a it's a policy innovation. The job guarantee is a fiscal policy innovation that has a very clear mission, and the mission is to well eradicate the ills of unemployment, um, to provide better 
foundation for macroeconomic stability and to really create some public good. So uh, what is the job guarantee? Why we need it and how do we, how do we make it happen? The job guarantee is a public policy that is a public option for a basic job at a basic wage benefit package, whereby the public sector would have a framework for federally funded um, jobs that will be locally created. It will be a policy on standby that will be available to the unemployed at all uh, phases of the business cycle, in the depths of a big crisis as we're facing now, but also in, in pretty good conditions, economic conditions, where we might have low levels of unemployment. Now, um, it is a it's a public option for jobs. It, you could think of it as a transitional job offer where the unemployed have like a stepping stone uh, to, uh, to paid employment and transition then out of the program to uh, better paid employment opportunities. It's also a safety net. Now, why, why might we need a job guarantee? Well, and the first argument I would make is that unemployment really is a policy choice. I think this is something that we discovered in World War II around the world. Governments discovered that actually you can create employment for everyone. And at the time, uh, I would invoke Keynes when he argued that, you know, our job was really to demonstrate that we can do this also for civilian purposes. And right? that that is a, um, the full employment is an objective and we need to be able to achieve the sort of levels of unemployment that we were able to achieve during wartime, but for civilian uh, in the civilian economy. However, we didn't really take the message uh, to heart. And so we have come to accept unemployment as a kind of a natural perennial feature of, of the economy. And we now call it the Nairu, the natural rate. Um, and, and, and in a sense, we don't really talk about other economic problems in the same, with the same language. You know, we don't talk about a natural rate of homelessness. We don't talk about a natural rate of illiteracy, a natural rate of hunger. And when we think about policies, we don't design policies or we don't, you know, around some sort of, you know, positive level of homelessness. You know, you know we should recognize that social and economic problems, uh, you know, can be, uh, you know, we, we have a long way to go to tackle some of these social economic problems, but we, unemployment has this unique feature, a unique position in our conversation. And we, we call it natural, unlike some of these other ills. And so in a sense, the public sector kind of, you know, stops providing stimulus or doing any measures once we think that the natural rate has been achieved. And, um, we, uh, you know, we, we kind of surrender to, to its costs. Now, the thing is that unemployment has all of the features of an epidemic. You know, when we have mass layoffs in certain centers, in urban or rural centers, they kind of ripple through the community. And it is the, you know, the standard story of the demand effect from the loss of jobs and income that then costs somebody else their profits and sales, that costs somebody else their jobs. So actually, even if you, if you like look at this through time, the unemployment rate through time, you see how it, it ripples through an economy, almost like a virus spreads through an economy, you know, through a community. And in, in, in the US, for example, unemployment is extremely volatile. You know, it's a, in the book, I call it a yo-yo effect. It, it shoots up in downturns and then it takes very long time to recover. So we are accustomed to these jobless recoveries. In the UK, actually, the situation is quite similar. The, in fact, these, these um, episodes are even more protracted. So we have become accustomed to, to unemployment and that brings a lot of costs uh, to people that experience uh, unemployment to their families, to communities, and also in terms of macroeconomic instability. Um, so, you know, another reason why we want to have uh, a job guarantee is to provide a, on standby, a support mechanism that creates uh, employment opportunities when the private sector doesn't have incentive to do so. And by, by doing so, then the program becomes a counter-cyclical stabilizer, if you will. 
Um, and we don't experience the yo-yo effect as much as we do today because when we stabilize incomes through employment, decent employment, then that um, the effect on the business community and the overall economy is far better than if we are to stabilize the economy accepting unemployment as, as inevitable. So, you know, just to, to conclude here, we really have only two choices, only two choices from a policy perspective. We either have guaranteed unemployment, which is basically that stylized fact in the economy and all of the associated costs, or we have guaranteed employment, a program that will provide employment to those who need it. That program then becomes the macroeconomic stabilizer and better stabilizer um, for prices in the sense that Josh mentioned, that we don't use the unemployed as the buffer that will tame any kind of inflationary pressures. In other words, when the private sector lays off uh, workers, they, instead of transitioning into a pool of unemployment, uh, the unemployed, they transition into a pool of employment. And that expenditure on that program is the very stimulus the economy needs to recover once again. When the economy recovers and private sector incomes grow, then the economy, then the program shrinks automatically as people transition out of it. And then uh, the, the, the public expenditure is reduced, taming any, any kind of inflationary pressures that might occur. So it, just to sum up, we have, uh, we have, I would say, public health reasons why we want to eradicate unemployment. We have macroeconomic reasons why a public option, employment option is a better stabilizer than the existing unemployment buff buffer stock. And we have a mission. You know, we have a mission to, um, to uh, provide a basic standard for jobs. We uh, all recognize the precarious nature of the labor market and there really isn't a structural policy that can secure that labor for, uh, floor for everyone. We have various measures. We have labor laws, we have minimum wages, but in the absence of, of an option for job, even the, the minimum wage is not a robust floor to incomes because the threat of unemployment then becomes the sort of macroeconomic force that structures uh, conditions in the private labor market. And so um, we can talk more in the Q&A of how to go about uh, and organize a job guarantee, but I think it's quite clear that uh, now we have so many, uh, so many areas of need in the midst of COVID, uh, we still have jobs that need to be done. We still require um, sanitation, we still require uh, public health um, responses, we still require uh, care for the elderly, we still require mobilization. Um, in, the in the meantime, our own communities are experiencing the ravages of climate. So I think that if we kind of broaden the, our vision of the public purpose, of our understanding of what useful and good jobs are, then the job guarantee can match the need for jobs by many with the need of the community for doing work that has been neglected and that is needed from environmental to elder care to um, public health. So I will stop here. We could talk in the Q&A about models for implementation uh, and maybe even experiences that uh, we, we can learn from around, from around the world. Thanks, Pavlina. That's a, a great introduction. Um, Robert, can I, can I ask you for your, for your thoughts on the, on the scheme? And maybe given you're a, a sort of historian of economic ideas, you could give us a bit of a, a reflection on, on the idea of a job guarantee, which of course has been around for a long, long time, um, and why it's sort of come in and out of, of favour over time, but never actually been uh, properly established as yet, and why now might be the time. Well, um, there, there, was a, there was a job guarantee, in fact, all through the uh, post-war period. It wasn't called that. It was... Um, called until the 1970s, it was called the full employment commitment. It was what all governments in, in, in the Western world undertook to do. And this I see, uh, this uh, proposal that Pavlina has been putting forward, I see as a modern way of fulfilling that full employment 
commitment uh, uh, and 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 avoiding some of the pitfalls um, of trying to you know implement it uh, that arose in the past. I mean, it's a very exciting idea, and I, and I don't think one should uh, um, in any way underplay the excitement of it. It 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 would if it was implemented as has been put forward, it would be the first time since the Industrial Revolution that unwanted unemployment would not exist. The first time in 200 years that there would be no more unwanted unemployment. People might choose not to work for a variety of reasons, but unwanted unemployment would be gone. Now that's a colossal vision, really, on which you can build all kinds of things, all kinds of different ways of life, um, different directions of policy. But it, 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 becomes, it becomes possible, and it just requires imagination and will to sort of get, get the whole thing moving. Now, uh, just a bit of why should one have an, an employment guarantee of any kind? <clears throat> why should the state be in the business? of providing employment. Many, many people um, trained in modern economics might dispute this. I mean, a, a really good neoclassical, neoclassically trained economist will say, well, the markets will always provide continuous full employment. And if there's a few, if there's a shock on the way, it'll bounce back very quickly. So all of this is completely um, irrelevant, essentially. It, it's superfluous to requirement. Or, the answer to that is, of course, markets do not maintain continuous full employment and they do not bounce back in a v-shaped way once a shock has has hit them unemployment stays around a very long time and then contributes to the progressive loss of skill of a large a, a, a fraction of the workforce um, and all kinds of other social problems so there's no full employment guarantee just in the market system. I mean, it's a point uh, Pavlina made as well. What there is, is a guarantee of unemployment. Mm -hmm. We're turning that, want to turn that into a guarantee of full employment. Now, the old way of doing it ran into problems. I mean, you know, the Keynesian governments tried to, try to, you know, put, inject money into the economy when it was slowing down, take it out of the economy when it was moving up again. They mistimed the cycle. They also, um, of course, um, ha had lots of spending was done for political reasons at the wrong time. And all those sort of problems led to a discrediting of that old Keynesian method of doing things. Now, I think we've got something better. It's an automatic system. It's a buffer stock um, that, that maintains a price for labor by simply buying and selling it in the way a buffer stock for commodities works. And, th and the government doesn't intervene uh, to decide um, when to buy and when to sell. And the government, in a way, the politicians are out of it, but it does the job. It's a very, very powerful stabilizer. And as, 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 as I said at the beginning, I think um, it's going to, it, if, it, if it's implemented, it'll abolish unemployment the next generation, for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. I'd like to ask Robert, um, what, one of the concerns around um, schemes such as this is that it would, it would lead to, um, could lead to excessive inflation. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning, we haven't had much of an inflation problem in the last decade, but is there a more general argument as to why it doesn't make sense to think that this would be an inflationary scheme? Yeah, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's got a built-in inflation, it's got a built-in inflationary barrier, which is that, that there's an automatic reduction in expenditures on the scheme. Right. The economy starts moving into inflation-prone territory. I mean, that's what one means by a stabilizer. It's not just a stabilizer of employment, it's simultaneously a stabilizer of prices. Labor is bought and sold at a, at a fixed price. And that, that price stabilizes the whole price system of the economy. So it's not inherently inflationary. In fact, it's less inflationary than the old Keynesian system because, you know, in 1960, there was, in the 1960s, why did inflation break out? Because Lyndon Johnson was doing something which was good, 
um, which was his Great Society program. He was also fighting an unpopular war. It was government, discretionary government spending that brought it about. This will prevent it. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So, Aror, I'd like to ask you to to come in next. I hear you're having some issues with your internet, so I think we'll just have you have your voice rather than your <laughs> badly. Um, but Aurora, you, you're a, a politician. Well, you used to be an economist. Now you're you're a politician, I guess. I mean, what are the what are the political challenges? Do you think for introducing this this kind of of scheme? And um, I know you've also been promoting the idea of the scheme in the context of the of a Green New Deal, which uh, you know Europe seems to be embracing uh, more rapidly, perhaps than other countries, certainly in the, the UK. So could you maybe reflect on those sort of two issues? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got a very uh, weak uh, internet and, uh, and my Wi-Fi is, is dying right now. Um, just a few words on inflation. I just wanted to tell you that I'll be very happy if one day we have some inflation back in Europe, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'll be so happy if we're going to have some, some inflation. That's a, a very uh, a quick remark, and, and so glad also to uh, uh, to hear uh, Robert um, uh, talk about uh, the Great Society uh, project. So I think that I, I will try to give you an insight from uh, both France and, and Europe. Um, I think that basically I will tell you why we need a, a job guarantee, why we probably won't have it, uh, why it's going to be hard to have it, and why uh, I think it is the right time to... Uh, to fight for it, actually. Uh, we need a job guarantee for several reasons. First, in France and Europe, uh, we have been facing uh, a mass and long-term unemployment for decades, uh, whereas uh, there are some unmet uh, needs in all sectors, education, health, old age, ecological transition, and, and so forth. And this is a, a, this is a typical situation in a uh, in a capitalist terms, the uh, coexistence of unemployment on one side and met uh, social needs on the other side. So the first reason we need a job guarantee in mass, is mass employment. The second reason is um, the Green New Deal. Uh, neither the government or the uh, market is taking care of the biodiversity and the biodiversity loss. And uh, if we want to avoid some uh, pandemic crisis, another pandemic, then I think we definitely uh, need a, a, a job guarantee in the biodiversity uh, sector. And in any case, if we are to implement a Green New Deal and uh, to invest in some uh, sector with very low return on investment, then we all need um, a job guarantee. The third reason is that uh, unemployment uh, costs a lot of money actually. I mean, it's not rational to have so many people unemployed. Uh, we've got to pay for unemployment uh, assurance, unemployment benefit. Uh, we've got some shortfall in taxes and uh, social securities. And plus there is a, a massive uh, indirect and induced cost uh, with unemployment. We've got, some, we've got to uh, pay for uh, health uh, issues, uh, mental health issues. Uh, we are losing, in fact, some 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 money with unemployment. So it's not rational to have um, mass unemployment. And the fourth uh, reason is that we are facing a, a major crisis. We've got a supply shock and uh, a demand shock. We've got more than uh, 14 million people unemployed uh, in Europe, and we've got to find some solution. And one of them is uh, is one more time. It's it, it's a job guarantee. The trouble is, is that we, um, there, I think that there is, um, we need to fight for it, but there are very few chances that, that we can have a job guarantee in Europe and in France for um, ideological reason, in fact. Uh, those last decades in a country like mine, every policy was uh, designed in a, with a supply side uh, approach, with a uh, trickle down economy uh, approach. If I can give you some uh, some example, for, for instance, in France, uh, we've got a system to help every firm that want to uh, uh, invest research. So uh, the French government is paying uh, jobs uh, in the private sector for research. It costs uh, two hundred thousand euros per job. 
it's very expensive. Whereas uh, if you, you, you look at job guarantee, job guarantee, it's like 18,000 euro per job. At the European level, it's exactly the same thing. If you look at the monetary policy, instead of funding the states, uh, the European Central Bank is um, running a quantitative easy, uh, easing policy, which, uh, and I, I will simplify right here, which is uh, funding the banking system so that the banking system can fund the real economy. And it's not working, but we keep doing it. So I think we've got to um, uh, fight against vested ideas and vested interests if we want to implement uh, this job guarantee. Having said that, at. I think it's the right time to, uh, to fight for it for several reasons because we need to find some so people want to spam, people want to, some solution governments need some solution we can also observe um, an ideological change in, uh, in the international in institutions such uh, as uh, uh, OECD World Bank and so on and um, also I think that uh, in times of crisis, some uh, new ideas can emerge. And I think that uh, job guarantee is uh, one, uh, one of these uh, ideas. And I'm so glad that, that I can talk for five minutes without uh, uh, interruption with my uh, Wi-Fi. Thank you. OK. Thank you. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was great. Yeah, I'm sorry about the picture. OK, that, well, that's been really uh, three really interesting contributions. We've got a number of questions coming in from the audience. I'm gonna sort of bite the bullet, I think, on the big one straight away, because uh, we've had two questions on this, uh, which is uh, you know, job guarantee versus universal basic income, um, the UBI uh, question. Um, so um, maybe I can ask Pavlina to uh, have a first shot at it, but I'm sure all the, all the panelists have their their views, but Nick Foster has, has asked, uh, with so many people already in jobs they regard as pointless, um, bullshit jobs as David Graeber puts them, uh, wouldn't a universal ba basic income be a better target than a, a job guarantee? I suppose implicit in that, in that question is, is, you know, is the government really going to be that much better than the private sector at creating you know, decent jobs that people would actually enjoy. I mean, you've made the point that one could set the the wage level, you know, at, at the minimum wage or just above it to, to act as a sort of buffer stock to keep to keep wages up, which of course is a good thing. But I mean, just just in terms of the quality of jobs, you know, how are we going to be assured that the government's going to create sort of decent, interesting jobs? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I. <laughs> I want to maybe address the second part first before, like whether they're complementary or you know, or conflicting policies. The the observation that some private sector jobs are undesirable or bullshit jobs is it comes from the way the private sector works, the motive, right, that drives job creation in the private sector. And let's not forget, labor is a cost, right, for the private sector. And so um, whether we're talking about poverty wages, terrible working conditions, whether we're talking about nonsense work that managing other people, um, you know, or you name it, um, there is a different basis on which the jobs are offered in the government sector. They are offered for the public purpose, for the public good, and they're not um, really uh, measured in terms of their commercial return. And so the way that we, we uh, evaluate with all public sector work, the benefit of the job is, um, is slightly different. And so, you know, we can, we can look at how people look at their public sector jobs. You know, a lot of people are showing satisfaction with them, but that's not to say that the government <laughs> always creates good jobs. I completely concede that you can, you can also do a job guarantee poorly, right? Now, how do we evaluate the need for a job guarantee? Is that the litmus test whether we should have it, that somebody might botch the job, right? Um, the, the question is, of course, you can find various, you know, uh, various ways of implementation. What we know from public service employment and small 
and large scale pub, uh, projects that are very much uh, of the kind that I'm talking about is extremely popular with people. In fact, during the New Deal, they were so popular that, um, you know, I write in the book, if uh, FDR had authorized the CWA, for example, he probably would have never been able to cancel it because people regarded it as a right. Uh, a lot of the work was in a kind of community, environmental work. People valued it. They, they felt the dignity of work. They knew that that was a better option than unemployment. But it's also a better option to a bullshit job, right? If you are working in, in a private sector job and you are faced with mass unemployment and you don't know whether you can hold on to that job, you will take any amount of uh, pay cuts, any uh, terrible work conditions, and you don't have an out. Now, I appreciate the UBI's call that, you know, base, universal basic income could be an out from a bad job, but it's not an in into a good job. And so there isn't really a structural mechanism that actually assures somebody having a, the, you know, a, a basic public option for jobs. And we do know from surveys, UBI surveys, basic income surveys, let me call them basic income surveys, that People like, still look for work, right? They are still, they would like to work, they still work for work, and they're still faced with mass unemployment. And so the job unity really is dealing with that structural, structural issue. The way I like to talk about this, and I've talked about it in my research, I've talked about participation income, that the job guarantee is this bottom up, um, in my conception, kind of from the ground up, uh, model of implementation and design that actually allows stakeholders to participate in the proposal of the projects that might be needed in their communities, the kind of work that they, they can do and want to do. And, you know, those, those projects are also uh, more, I would say, you know, they, they, they have a better lasting effects because people just know what they need in their community. So in a sense, it is a participation income, but we have a coordinating mechanism that actually puts, you know, folks to jobs. Artists, musicians, right? It, like it's not a very narrow conception of what, what a job is. Um, so I'm just going to stop right here. So, so just, just to follow up on that, how exactly would this work? That the government would review different proposals by local communities or civil society groups or, or municipalities for jobs and, and fund those it felt sort of somehow met the, the public purpose. Is that the, the basic mechanism? Yeah, so let me just give a concrete example. Um, in many countries around the world, we have unemployment offices, right? We call them job centers. Now imagine that if you went into a job center, you actually were guaranteed that you can walk out with the job, right? And if you can't find private sector jobs, there will be a public mechanism to provide a public sector job. How would that happen? It will have to be federally funded program for all the macroeconomic reasons that we discussed. You know, that the unemployment is a macroeconomic condition. The government is responsible for paying the cost of unemployment already. It's not about if, it's about how we pay those costs. So then that will be federally funded. But from the administration point of view, imagine a situation where these unemployment offices become the jobs bank. They solicit proposals from the ground up, from the locality, from the municipality, from community groups that are already dealing with other uh, aspects of social deprivation, right? Other social de deprivations, environmental care. I mean, we just, there are so many groups that are already trying to do this. We just need to scale up their efforts and support their efforts, create much more. And so um, you can imagine a, a, a way of proposal from the ground up that goes through some basic checkpoints through the locality or the state and then gets final approval at the federal level. But really it is the, the majority of the work is done um, at the community level. Mm -hmm. Okay. Robert, um, can I ask you for your, for your... I want to get back to UBI. Sure, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Okay. There is a few questions specifically, maybe, that you could yep. have a go at. So there's one question here, and it's kind of like, you know, how do we bring the private sector with us, I guess? Is, isn't there a risk that if you're giving everyone these very good public sector jobs, even when the economy picks up, and even if you, you might get paid a bit more in the private sector, actually you want to stay put in your nice, you know, public good, public purpose, public sector job. And then the, the private sector starts feeling like it's getting you know, left behind and you get arguments about crowding out and this, and this kind of stuff. How do you respond to that? Oh, you, won't, you won't be allowed to stay in. You won't be allowed to stay in the public sector job pool if you're, being, if you're refusing a better paid job outside it. 
It's right. as simple yeah, as I mean that you're not not eligible any longer for for for, for your public sector um, job if there is a better job at a higher wage of, uh, available outside it in in your area given you know given where you are and so on. So the pool the pool um, augments and shrinks automatically. Right. It's it's not that people hang on in these um, in the public sector jobs. Um, or that the same number of people hang on forever and ever and ever, independently of what's going on in the private sector. That's not how a buffer stock works any more than you have the same amount of wheat in a wheat buffer stock, independent of the cycle. You know, I mean, it, it's, uh, it, it, it waxes and wanes. So that, that, that doesn't arise. That possibility doesn't arise unless the scheme is terribly laxly administered and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, so you're saying you wouldn't be allowed to, to stay in a public sector job if there was a better private sector job. I mean, that, that's, the whole point of, that, that's the whole point of the job scheme in the first place, that um, you become eligible for a public sector job when you cannot get someone that is willing and able to work when they cannot get a job um, in the private sector under the, con under the conditions of private sector employment. In other words, at a minimum wage and, 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 um, and other, uh, other conditions laid down by law. If you're willing and able to work and cannot get a job in the private sector, you are offered a public sector job. But by the same token, you can't stay in the, in the public sector job if you now are offered um, a, 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 a minimum wage and, 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 and decent condition job in the private sector. I just, I think uh, maybe Pavlina just wants to come in on that point. Did you, Pavlina? I mean, I think that as a practical matter, what Robert is saying is what's going to happen. If you get better conditions in the private sector, you you don't stay in the public. Well, I would just put it slightly differently, that I wouldn't refuse the, the a person, the public service job, if there is a better employment offer. Um, there may be many reasons why somebody might want to stay at the very basic, basic job, but it is a, this is a question of design, of how do we help people improve uh, their working experience, their opportunities, how they climb whatever, you know, the economic ladder. So I would say that, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I'd be very careful not to make it kind of a work fair where I, you know, you remove, you know, there may be like other reasons why somebody may refuse a private sector job that are, you know, apart from pay, right? Yeah. Maybe they're not suitable. Somebody with disability is not able to actually work that better paid job. And maybe this is fitted better for people's needs. I think that the counter cyclical feature is, is just an inherent feature to this program. But because there's always a component of, of folks that are in unemployment and it changes who they are. I feel that we will always have uh, some employment in the, in the job guarantee job right and that that it would be a stylized fact just like unemployment is a stylized fact today and that's perfectly acceptable okay and we, we've got a question here from the audience just asking whether the the jobs would be compulsory and you in your model this would be a voluntary scheme you, you wouldn't have to take a job if you if you didn't want to you yeah but, absolutely um, i mean you um it's an option, right? It's a public option. It's kind of like public school. Think of it this way. You can go to private school. You know, you have choices. But it, we do guarantee a seat to yeah. any student, right? <clears throat> Arul, I want to come to you now. We've got, you, uh, got your face on the screen. Um, just on the UBI point, because UBI is quite big in, in, in Europe um, as well. Um, what, what do you see as the sort of advantages of a job guarantee, if you, know, if you do, over a UBI? Or, or would you you know, want to combine them in some way? What's your, your view on this debate? Uh, 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 you, you can see me, but I'm not sure I can hear you very well. Ah, uh, uh, so can you say that again? Yeah, so, so just on the UBI um, point, um, you okay. know, what's your view? Because it's quite popular. It's a big movement in Europe. Yes. Wow, yeah. Definitely. So I, I think that most of the time we are opposing basic income and uh, job guarantee. But I think that uh, when you have to face 
a major crisis like we are facing right now because uh, I mean in few months I think we're gonna have a, a banking crisis in Europe so we're gonna have a very uh, high level of mass unemployment so when you are in this kind of situation i think that you get to use every tool every economic tool that you can use so i think we can do both actually but not at the same time in the first um it, there is a first step when we can use the european central bank to fund uh the household and uh the companies uh with a, a kind of helicopter money for for a few months i think so it, it it won't cost us uh anything at all and the european central bank sorry can do it actually the european central bank is not allowed to fund the states but it can uh fund every uh private actor so i think i would go for a couple of months of basic income funded by the european central bank mm -hmm. and uh then we could we could implement uh, the uh, the job guarantee in a, a Green New Deal uh, approach. I think we could do both, actually. I'm not sure that uh, Pavlina and Robert will agree, uh, will agree with me, but I think uh, it, it could be uh, a good idea to, to do both. We're in doing it at the moment. We're doing it at the moment. We are. The, the central bank is funding two or three months of basic income for a large section of the population. But of course, they don't think um, they don't think they can go on doing that. And indeed, you can't. You, I mean, the, the thing about the question you have to ask about universal basic income is how is it going to be paid for? I mean, that is a basic question. You're paying people for doing nothing. How are you going to pay for it? I mean, and the normal argument, the argument which made the whole idea of uh, income maintenance possible. Um, reduced hours of work was the improvement in productivity. I mean, that's how every reputable scheme of basic income has argued the case. You get increases in productivity rather than have the increases completely captured by, you know, a small class of owners. You, you capture it by the state and that is then the basic, a national dividend is then the basis of your universal basic income. I mean, no one talks like that, but it's an obvious, it's an obvious thing to think about. Then, then, you, then, you, then you've got into an argument, but you have to have the productivity coming through in the first place. If you have no productivity, and productivity is almost zero recently, you, you know, you have a problem of how you fund universal basic income. It's very, very simple to me anyway. It's an economic argument. Economists, every economist will understand this argument. And, and in fact, it's quite simple. Pavlina, do you want to come in on that? Yes, I would, I would separate the financial from the real costs. I think that what Robert is talking about is the real costs of, of, this, uh, of the UBI program. And I think they're very important and significant. So, you know, we, we still have the scourge of unemployment. We still have all of the costs associated with unemployment that uh, Aurore was just discussing, and we have negative productivity. It's quite straightforward that this is basically kind of a paradigm of a neglect. Providing people income is not really going to, you know, do the productivity enhancements and improve all these real costs. And we actually know from research on unemployment, the vast majority of these costs are non-pecuniary. So like when you're just looking at interventions that are based strictly on income, there's never gonna be enough, right? What do you um, mean by non-pecuniary, sorry? Non-pecuniary, for example, uh, the um, cognitive impact, children of unemployed people, how they perform in schools, their long-term uh, experience in the labor market, the isolation, loss of social network, um, I mean, physical uh, it's, it's like lasting effect mortality okay mortality is well documented and also has lasting effect from long-term unemployment we are talking about things that we are not calculating if we had calculated these as macroeconomists we will not be holding on to the natural rate concept for very long i think from the financial point of view i think we got to separate you know you know can we afford it financially and it, it's a matter of a budget you know what uh, a, a UBI proposal would be about 20 to 30 percent of a budget, right, of, a, you know, of GDP if it is at living wage level and it provides living income to anyone rich or poor. Can we financially afford it? Can a government dedicate 20 to 30 percent of its budget for that? 
Yes, of course they can. We have seen it in war. We have seen it in other extreme circumstances. Is that a good use of the public purse and the funding of the economy? I would, I would submit no, because it does not have the counter cyclical features of the job guarantee. You cannot on a permanent basis be dedicating 30% of your budget to supporting a basic income. Um, and that does not actually, in any direct sense, increase productivity the way you know, that, that Robert is, uh, uh, is highlighting. So I think that there are macroeconomic issues of providing an unconditional universal, at all times, universal basic income. Of course, um, you know, when we talk about basic income, we talk about all sorts of different types and so the, in, in the, the job guarantee proposal always says that it is situated within a broader welfare safety net that provides income support to those who cannot participate in this program for whatever reason, whether you're a student, whether you're a caretaker, uh, whether you're a person with disability. So in other words, they, they are together complementary, but it is the basic income, I think, proposal that is more amenable to this um, you know, to this framework of thinking rather than the U universal basic income. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Well, I think we'll try and move on from the UBI job guarantee debate. Uh, we have a question here um, around I ideology. Um, well, let, let's first have a question here from for Robert, perhaps. What lessons can be learned from the retreat from the full employment commitment uh, of the post-war period I'm thinking particularly of the failure to transition jobs from industries subject to structural change with nationalization rather than restructuring and investing in new technologies. Uh, Robert, do you have a, that's from David Madigan. Do you have any thoughts? Well, on yeah, you know, I think if you look at the matter historically, there was never as much consensus behind the, uh, the sort of Keynesian uh, demand management um, system as, as, as we, think in retrospect, a large section of industry in America particularly was always opposed to this kind of thing. I mean, Roosevelt was regarded by a section of American business as just as bad as Hitler, if not worse, uh, and Stalin. And so there was, there was quite a lot of opposition to government taking a, a, a big role in the economy, in the management of the economy, despite the fact that a lot of the American post-war prosperity was based on government arms procurement, which sort of set, you know, set going many of the, many of the, you know, uh, things we now thought, think of as, 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 as um, uh, the digital revolution. But so, but there was ideological hostility. Um, there was a strong, gradual, growing feeling that um, governments were making um, matters worse. As the Keynesian system itself started to get into trouble towards the end of the 1960s. And once you could saddle, um, you could saddle two, two things on, 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 on the Keynesian system. One, that it was inflationary. Um, and the second, that it was really supporting a lot of boon, boondoggles, sort of a whole lot of waste, wasteful activity. Mm. Once public sector unions got rather powerful and started, um, you know, um, um, pulling their weight in the public sector, so a whole coalition, ideological, political, sort of gathered force. And once inflation started to take off in the 1970s, it was able, it was able to, to get political power. And that's, I think, how the, how the Keynesian method unraveled was a, a partly ideological, partly, partly structural. And of course, when, when the private sector took over the management completely and expelled the government from any, any, any share in, in, in directing the economy, then all um, a, a, attempts at setting a course for the economy, whether to maintain manu a manufacturing sector um, or you know, whatever, whatever uh, direction, vanished as well. In Germany, the Germans retained uh, a manufacturing base um, much better than anyone else because I think of the embeddedness of the trade unions in the industrial system of Germany, um, which was absolutely not true anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, I could go on, but I think I've tried to answer the question 
Yeah, no, 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 that's that's very uh, very helpful. Um, we've got a question here that maybe Pavlina could have a go, but may, maybe a whole might have some views as well. This is just on uh, the the extent to which a, a job guarantee is feasible in a um, developing country or maybe an emerging market, Pavlina, because um, obviously the way you've talked about the job guarantee is is a, a sort of alongside a, a sovereign currency issuing nation that, that, that clearly you can afford it under those um, circumstances. Um, but what about if your currency is, you know, is, is constrained, you have a lot of foreign denominated debt, for example, and there's the inflation risk is coming through imports. Um, is that a barrier or, or is it, is this a scheme that, that developing countries should be also looking to implement? Yes, they should be looking to implement it. First, um, the reason is because we're paying for it. One way or another, we're paying for it. As Aurora was just enumerating, some of the costs of, of, of unemployment of, are very high. And in fact, let me, let me actually address this by thinking through how this is an innovation in fiscal policy. All right, what do we do we, through fiscal policy? We provide tax cuts, we provide incentives, we provide contracts to firms, we provide all sorts of subsidies, you name it. We provide a lot of support for, for the private sector in the name of job creation that doesn't really quite come in sufficient numbers for all. And then the public sector picks up the tab for, for unemployment. So it is true that countries with sovereign uh, currencies have far more fiscal space to deal with this. But the question is that there are already embedded costs in our budgeting and in our macroeconomic uh, just natural expenditures that are tied to the existence of unemployment. So any, any policy, any measure to reduce unemployment would be a better, I would say, value for money, right? Um, now, on the other hand, when you consider, it, it has been in the developing world where we have seen some of the largest scale policies and, and with, with some significant success, whether you're looking at India's rural employment guarantee, whether you're looking at South Africa's, you know, expanded public works program, whether it's, it's Argentina, um, they have been the feasibility actually question, you know, we see more recent examples from those countries than we have seen in the developed world. Now I do concede that you will have, you might run against some issues and problems if you have a pegged exchange rate, if you have a currency board, if you sufficiently manage to increase the standard of living and, you know, from the ground up and create sufficient growth you might actually, you know, have a lot more, you know, increase in net imports and that might put a pressure on exchange rates. So it is, it is correct that, you know, it's a value policy, value judgment, what is more important? Is it a stable exchange rate or is it unemployment? I think these things have to be put in the forefront to be very explicit that they are policy priorities, they're value decisions that we have put uh, this, what Keynes calls the quasi slump right, as a condition for price stability and currency stability. And what we are suggesting is that, in fact, we don't have to have a quasi slump to uh, have economic stability. And, um, you know, in, in some cases, you know, the currency issue has to be rethought. Um, the, I mean, there were, there were other, other issues to say about, um, about fiscal policy, but when we were talking about inflation, you know, what, what we notice in, at least in developing, but even in the developed, the developing countries, the developed countries, is that the conditions of those who are high skill and high educated are the, the first ones to improve after a downturn. And there is a sort of wage bidding up that occurs in the labor market. So whatever growth we have that is jobless growth is more inflationary from the labor market perspective in the sense that we're bidding up the wages of those who have the high income folks, right? Where we can have job led growth that is lifting up the wages from the floor and we're improving the conditions of those who have the least, the, the least, um, uh, are least able to, to catch on to this sort of jobs train. So it's not going to be the panacea to inflationary pressures. They will be inflationary pressures that will come from other parts of the economy, but not from the job guarantee itself. Okay, great. Um, I think we've temporarily lost our war sadly, but hopefully she'll, uh, she'll come back to us. Um, we have a question here, which, which may be sort of going back to the earlier question, maybe Robert, you could have a think about. So um, 
the, the 2010 to 2015 period, I think this is from Dan, Dan Wainwright, I think he's probably talking about the UK here, saw a lot of language around strivers and shirkers. Uh, do you think there's a risk that, because we're talking about a voluntary scheme here, that, that those who choose not to take a public sector job guarantee scheme job, and there may be good reasons for this, would, would see the quality of support eroded even more. They'd be painted as unwilling to work um, and, uh, because of their refusing a, a job. Is there a risk uh, that this sort of language of shirkers and strivers would, would, would come back even with this scheme? How would you prevent that happening? Well, I mean, I think, I think um, you know, you've got to think of the two words, willing and able. I mean, if, 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 if someone isn't able, able to work or you know have a have a have a have a have a have a private sector job for one reason or another mental physical then of course you don't say oh well we're not going to support you you've got to take whatever's going so it's willing and able i mean those are those are the two two things um you um uh, very much uh, need um to bear in mind always now shirkers and I mean, there's a, there, is a, there, is an, there is an issue. There is an issue, and it's a hard issue. If someone, refu if someone um, um, uh, refuses a public sector job you know, that's on offer, uh, does he lose his un unemployment pay? Um, it, are they alternatives? In other words, Someone says, I mean, I don't think it's going to be very, very likely that this will happen, but I mean, it may happen. Someone who is able and willing to work chooses not to work, which is, of course, their right. But are they then also um, entitled to the full range of benefits um, that um, they, 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 can, they can claim as unemployed people? Now, I mean, people argue the toss differently. I would, I would say I'm quite hard line on this which is I go rather for the old trade union um, view, which was work or maintenance. If you, if you don't have any jobs available for you, you get maintained. That's the duty of the state. But you don't have the right to refuse work and still claim maintenance. I mean, the trade unions were very, very, very clear about this. Um, but now um, we, we've sort of become much more blurry and soft-hearted about it. And I don't think you're ever going to get a scheme off the ground that um, really um, um, allows people to play the whole system in, 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 in a way um, uh, and, and doesn't make, make, confront them with some choices as well. Uh, and and, and that, that, that I think um, is something um, that people who are um, too soft-hearted about this um, uh, often miss. Okay. Pavlina? Uh, I mean, I, I think maybe... You may not agree like, with me, Pavlina. <laughs> no, no, I think maybe it's slightly, like, definitely, in, because it's, it's, a policy, it's a policy question, right? And it's a question of how it's going to be implemented and how it's going to be used. And so we already um, live in an extremely punitive kind of environment, right? Unemployment is... Uh, is sort of the disciplining factor, both for private sector jobs, but also for benefits, right? Folks, I mean, at least in the United States, you know, we make uh, benefits conditional on jobs that are not there. And so there is just a lot of, uh, you know, if you, if you see what to get unemployment insurance, what you have to do to apply and prove yourself worthy, I think, you know, the, the system is designed to be punitive. Now, what do we want to do going forward with the job guarantee? I mean, it's just a job right? It's just a job. You go into the unemployment office. If you're looking for work, we provide it. And, and so if, if we provide it, then you don't automatically tap into some of these other, other things. If you don't want the job, you don't show up at the unemployment office, right? I mean, you might want to be collecting unemployment benefits. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily deny somebody their unemployment benefits because there may be various reasons why they may need the unemployment benefits they might actually have a better, better a chance to you know, find employment quite quickly. They might need the time off. For whatever personal family reasons, they may be you know, even disability. We know that people with disabilities in the US were the last ones to have their employment um, conditions improve 
folks with disability do want work, but the work is not suitable in the private sector where the public service, one of the jobs is to make them to enable people who want to work to, to work, to, to fit the job to the person. Um, would we deny disability benefits to somebody who has, has not quite found the employment opportunity that's suitable? We will not. Yeah, and I think you agree. I, I think I think I, agree. I mean that's not that's not that's not an issue. I also don't disagree at all that there should be a, a period when you allow, when you, you're paid unemployment benefit and, and you have a search period, maybe three I, months, it may be six months or something like that. I don't I think, yeah, for the US, yeah, for the European context that might, you know, it makes more sense because there are some countries that just provide, you know, un, you know, no time limits for an employment insurance in, in the US, you know, you've got a few weeks and you're done. Yeah. Um, but, but what I'm saying is that a, if, if it just was a, considered as a program that was just an add on jobs program, it will have just naturally some of these positive reductions in the extraordinary costs that states are picking up, but they're invisible. We don't make the direct link to unemployment. And so budgets are going to improve because, you know, not so many kids in the U.S. will apply for the meals program in, uh, in the schools. Uh, budgets are going to improve, well, because of the local tax revenue, of course, they're not sovereign. Uh, budgets will improve because not many people are going to show up for the emergency room and the medication and all the other subsidies that are associated. There's, so we don't actually do this kind of research to find the full cost of unemployment. I think it's extraordinary. And so just as a, as a plug, as this kind of inoculation, I think we will see a lot of uh, a lot of natural reductions in these in these um, welfare programs that are so contentious. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Um, so we have a question here from Jake Sumner. How do we accelerate the move to the green economy through the employment response to, to COVID nineteen? Should there be a right to train and retrain uh, in green skills as part of a, of a job guarantee? Um, sort of scheme, you know, do, do we need it? Can we just create jobs to support a Green New Deal without training or, or do the two things sort of need to, to go together? And I guess a follow-up question would be, you know, would that sort of slow down the, 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 the stabilization dynamic a bit if you're having to train people up before they, or you maybe you start paying them as you're, you're training them. Robert, do you want to come in on that? I'd like, I mean, I think Pavlina ought to have a go at this. Okay. Because, cool. I mean, um, you know, the link with the green economy is something that was stressed very much in your book. And I think by, by many advocates um, who, who see it as a way of getting a, a green direction. So perhaps I, I could come in a, a, a little later. Um, after Pavlina and Aurora have... Um, Aurora's still not with us, unfortunately. Oh, I see. She hasn't come back yet. All right. So I think that the successful job guarantee will have to have a strong training and education component. I have no doubt. Uh, we want to help people transition into the kinds of private sector jobs they want. And, you know, they might not be prepared. So what we currently do is we have training programs, but we don't have the job option. So we are, you know, we are training people for jobs that are not there. Um, also, training is not a terribly effective um, alone, a terribly effective um, tool for job creation because the kind of training that one needs to be successful is one that takes very long time. It's not even training, it's the educational experience that one has, like 20 years, right? Like if you, if you need to switch a job, your employer is gonna give you a crash course, it's gonna give you like six months of training. It's not that big of a hurdle, even though we hear these conversations, right? So in the green economy, we will need people to learn how to install solar panels. We will need to, you know, to, to train people to do some concrete work. So no doubt, I fully am you know, supportive of a training component. Now, the job guarantee is part of the Green New Deal because it is, well, it provides that safety net uh, that, you know, that, that has always been the looming question in the climate discourse. You know, if we get rid of the fossil fuel jobs, you know, what do we have? And that has been, it's being used in local communities as, as kind of a hostage argument against, uh, you know, the Green New Deal because some towns might be dependent on oil exploration, right? But now we have a job guarantee. Now we know it's assured that you can transition. Mm. Now, um, as I argue in the book, it, the job guarantee is a macroeconomic fiscal policy. It's not a, um, it's not just 
a one-off uh, industrial strategy for the Green New Deal, even if we do the green transformation so long as the economy goes through ups and downs, we don't want the collateral damage to be the unemployed. So we want to have that as a permanent, as a permanent uh, feature. And um, so in terms of like the green work, one argument, one question was, well, if the jobs are so necessary, do we really want this anti-cyclical feature? Mm. So my answer to this is, well, number one, you have to do the job that needs to be done, right? You build a bridge because it needs to be built, not because there is a recession. Um, the job guarantee does something slightly different. So, you know, in my ideal world, I would have preferred to have a job guarantee before COVID, not when I were faced with 40 million people unemployed. Mm. Um, and when it comes to the Green New Deal, I think that all manner, technology, know-how and experience has to be dedicated for the green transition, full stop. Um, but the job guarantee will uh, need to be flexible, agile, for sure, for a component of people that will come and go. Can we design jobs like this? Surely we can. The private sector constantly lays off and hires people. Why shouldn't the public sector be able to do so? Now, there is certain kind of work that is more amenable to this. And actually, green work happens to be that kind of work that you can speed up tree planting or slow it down. You can actually delay certain projects and, and crank up others. You can add extra help in classrooms and more class activities and maybe you know remove some depending on the but we will have a permanent infrastructure that at least will be able to absorb people as they, as they come and go. So I, I think this is how the framework that I use to think about these questions. Yeah, could I just, um, yes, I think that's absolutely sensible. I mean, this idea that, you know, you're going to, con you know, consign people to digging up holes and filling up, filling them up again, because there's nothing else for them to do in a community seems to be total rubbish. I mean, there's masses of stuff to do. And in, in terms of beautification, in terms of uh, um, environmental improvements, in terms of, of heating uh, and uh, housing. And it's very important that, um, you know, your finance comes from the center, but they're locally administered. The local authorities know what needs to be done. Mm. And of course, big things, you can't just turn them on and off. Um, like, um, like um, you know, leave a bridge half built um, because you're in the wrong phase of the cycle. You can't do that. But there are lots of other things that you can turn on and off and, 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 and allow to fluctuate depending on whether you have the money. You, you might say, well, why aren't these things being done at the moment? Um, uh, and of course, you could add to um, care of the care of the uh, community, care of the environment, care of people care of old people particularly is one of the things that, I mean, we have a you know, big shortage of carers. Why don't we have it at the moment? Because we've had a big austerity um, uh, decade in which all these services, which could have been actually kept going, have been shut down. And, and so um, there's a question of, um, I think the, the public sector job guarantee is, is, is a way of reviving uh, all kinds of work that comes under the natural uh, authority of the of local government funding it from the center and allowing and allowing allowing the local authorities to get on with it that includes having job job banks they should have portfolios of jobs that are available necessary to be done in the community that aren't being done at the moment because there's no money for them. so all, i mean and then historically look at the new deal the extraordinary things that civilian Conservation Corps and uh, other New Deal programs achieve, not just picking up leaves, I mean, but, you know, beautification, orchestras, education, mm. uh, masses of environmental conservation projects all over, all over the place. Are we, are we really saying that no one has enough imagination um, for, for, for um, uh, de devising jobs other than breaking up stones and 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 and, and um, you know um, chucking them over over the over the cliff I mean it, it's just it's a ridiculous idea there, there is a kind of like digging holes job that I really like and that is capturing carbon back into the ground the one that we have extracted <laughs> very many years that, that. <laughs> okay um, we've got a specific question here on the Indian NREGA scheme. Are you familiar with that, Pavlina? Yeah, I am. 
Yeah, so this is from Neil Coleman. He says it combines in some sense a universal grant with uh, an employment guarantee. If there's not a public job available within a specified period, you are then given the cash equivalent. Are permutations of this worth considering, particularly in situations in developing countries where there's not adequate infrastructure to ensure universal employment? Okay, so the rural employment guarantee, it's, it's a guarantee of 100 days of work in a rural project, so it's not universal. Um, and uh, in some cases, uh, to circumvent, and I think that that was a technological kind of innovation, to circumvent some of the problem with the payment at the local level, people were issued a universal card where they can get their payments directly. Uh, and so, in, like I could, in, in a way, um, it was the locality that was responsible for finding the rural employment opportunity. So you could see a situation where there might be, you know, problems with organization and you can get the payment. Um, those details, I will, um, frank, uh, to be honest, I'm not quite uh, familiar with exactly what happens. Um, do you not get the payment if there isn't actual project that has been has been created? I know that there are some communities that are experiencing just that are uh, that are um, that have just cash programs. Okay, now the rural employment uh, program has a, a really fantastic example of environmental projects that make a material difference in some very impoverished communities, and it has been the only program that. Uh, now folks are able to rely on and that has increased employment in the midst of COVID, especially as urban people have been losing their employment and moving back to the rural communities and applying for jobs. And so there are some, you know, studies on the environmental effects, on the water systems, on, you know, irrigation, on, um, you know, assets created for, for rural. So it's a very interesting um, program to study. What would be, you know, what is the hybrid you know, for me, you know, for me, the issue is employment opportunity, right? You, you, that's, that's the issue. You, you can envision a program today in the U.S. where anything takes planning, right? So you put in, pl in place a job guarantee, you get, you enroll the unemployed, the job is to stay at home, right? So in a sense, it's a basic income, right? That's the job, like it's my job to stay at home and not be in the classroom, right? I get paid. But at the same time, we actually have an infrastructure where folks who are already enrolled in this program can then be placed into the kinds of acute areas of acute shortages to start working uh, right away. Whether it is the food kitchens, whether it is the sanitation in the field hospitals, we need work. And so that's the, the job guarantee is really, that's the goal for it, mm. to create employment. Okay. Yeah, I think there's one, just could I make one? Yeah comment on the rural, on you know the developing world i mean the i think you know the, the old problem in developing countries as analyzed by the economists was that there was a hell of a lot of um, um, rural underemployment mm -hmm. and and you know the only the only answer that sort of seemed to be given by the market system was they all go into the cities and then you get development of huge slum urban slums and and, and, and not, not very much growth. So in, in a sense, I, I interpret some of these um, uh, job guarantee um, schemes, rural schemes, as a way of actually making the countryside more productive um, and um, uh, uh, dealing, dealing with rural underemployment. Um, we never thought, of course, that we'd have a permanent problem of underemployment in the developed world, but we do now as well. I mean, headline un unemployment figures in Britain and the United States are only about half of, of, um, of uh, the actual unemployment that exists. People not being able to work as, as, as long as they'd like to. Mm. And, um, the, and the public sector scheme would actually um, take up that lot of people as well. They, that it's not only that they can't get a private sector job, that, that's, the, that's the obvious case, but that they'd like to work for 35 hours or something like that, and they can only get 10 hours or 15 yeah. hours. That's, that's something that's a problem with us. Yeah, big underemployment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Avelina, yeah, Just, come in, and then I've got another question for you. Yeah. One last comment on something that Robert says is very important, that the, the impact of austerity on the public sector, really, really want to highlight it because 
uh, we're, we might be putting a little too much on the shoulders of the job guarantee because we have had such a decimation in the public sector and the services. And there's so many areas of our life that are underfunded and understaffed. And that, uh, you know, in, in, in the U.S., we have food deserts, areas where we don't have good, decent access to good quality food. In Europe, there are medical deserts, you know, like areas that don't have decent care. I think that, you know, uh, we, we want to rethink the public purpose, the public sector, fortify the sort of things that need to be done on an ongoing basis and done well. The job guarantee, in fact, in that kind of world, the job guarantee would be rather small, right? It will be the component that deals with the mass layoffs as a consequence of the business cycle. But right now we are you know, we're seeing everywhere neglect and need, and we're saying, well, here you go, the job guarantee can do that. We, we want to be able to do these things in tandem, strengthening permanent services and providing the public option. Yeah, okay. Uh, we'll wrap up shortly, I think, but, it, but we've had a question here on, you know, where is this actually gonna happen? Because uh, you, you've both made it sound like a fantastic scheme, but, but uh, Pavlina, you've been traveling around the world trying to uh, presumably encourage this to actually happen. Where, where do you think um, the, the sort of, the most likely places are where this kind of thing is, is starting to happen or could happen? Listen, my experience teaches me that these things happen by surprise, you know, when when uh, I studied uh, the Argentinian uh, program, it was, uh, you know, sure, sheer coincidence that, you know, I got a phone call from somebody who said, hey, look, we've been trying to model the employer of last resort. And it was, they've tried for many years, but in the midst of a depression crisis, one person pulled it off the shelf and put it in place. So we don't know. What I do know is that there is a lot of people are trying. They're really trying to envision what they could do. And the federal government won't step in, which communities and municipalities might be able to do job creation projects. I've been talking to a lot of people in Europe who are from trade unions to European Commission, how to think about uh, you know, how, uh, the unemployment problem. Um, we have Experimental programs, you know, we have a youth guarantee in Europe that's not working very well, but it might be a legal framework to move forward. We have had the Future Jobs Fund in the, United, the UK, which has been very successful and is being now talked about as a model for, for future job guarantee. There is, I think, lots of appetite around the world for, for some sort of more direct and bold response. And I think we need to be very, um, committed to this fight because I am sure that all governments, democratic or authoritarian, are going to have to reckon with mass unemployment and they will come around to the idea of d direct job creation. That, that will happen in one way or another. And the question is on what terms is it going to happen? And will it be again, once again, one of those like patch up jobs where it's just a band-aid without the actual structural uh, components? I think that's where like the work needs to be on articulating why, uh, you know, if we are to attempt direct employment programs for the unemployed, they also have to have the legal framework and policy framework to make these durable. Right. Robert, the, the UK government is, is their, their strategy seems to be to just pay the private sector large sums of money to sort of take people on or not get rid of them. Um, you know, is it, is, is it, do you see any sign of this sort of attitude shifting? Is this the wrong sort of government for this, for this scheme? Well, I think it's, again, it's, 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 it's a way you can break out of doing nothing without actually um, uh, claiming any, any extra, particular extra role for government. I mean, the, the, the difficulty here is whether the inducements um, which the government are offering the private, I don't think are nearly enough. To get them to restart on the scale that um, is necessary to avoid a, re a recession. So there are going to be many more decisions that are going to have to be made in October um, when, when, when we have our, the budget, which haven't been made now. But the way I would argue, I mean, to go back to the basic question, first of all, you've got to establish a case that the state shouldn't just intervene in the economy in grave emergencies, but it should, it should always have a role, uh, both to keep the keep, uh, economy at a high level of activity in the right direction and to deal with fluctuations. Then, what is the best way of implementing that? Then you can 
get into the argument. Okay, you, you know, anyone can scatter a lot of helicopter money around in, a, in, 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 you know, in, in, in an emergency, but how are you going to keep this role going? And mm. is it necessary? Um, and then I think you can start winning the argument on the practicalities. But unless you have that framework, I think governments will always be tempted to think of all these things as emergencies only. And as soon as things get a bit better, they'll forget, it, forget about it. Great. Pavlina, did you have a last word? No, I think that, I think that that's it. I think that the, the vision really is the following. Shaking up this very tacit assumption that we can't do anything about unemployment. We don't think about other things like this. You know, I mean, it, we do recognize that, uh, you know, some kids will not be able to go to school. There will be illiteracy, but we don't say it's just natural. We can leave it like that. We, we tend to think about interventions uh, guaranteeing certain kinds of basic securities. And, uh, you know, a lot of folks are maybe scared of the word guarantees, but we need to recognize that guarantees are everywhere. The government actually provides all sorts of guarantees and it has no trouble intervening in markets to guarantee prices, as Robert was saying, of commodity prices, our deposits, um, you know, basic contracts. We have guarantees and we are able to also just guarantee some very basic, you know, economic security through employment. There are other dimensions. That's kind of a missing piece. So I think that this is where uh, I hope the conversation is, is going to go to question really that it's unavoidable and and as economists are saying it's even necessary for price stability that we have an alternative we have another program that can give us better economic and price stability brilliant okay well thank you pavlina and robert that was a brilliant uh, debate unfortunately we lost Aro, but thanks to Aro in her absence and um i'll let you you both uh, go just to remind everyone uh, that our next event, if I can just share my screen, is uh, coming up. That is um, some more than others. Um, and we'll be focusing on inequality. So that's uh, the last in, the, in our series of COVID-19 events. Uh, we've got Danny Dawling, uh, who's a professor at Oxford University. Damon Silvers, who's the uh, head of policy at the US uh, trade union body, AFL-CIO, um, and William Spriggs, also from the AFL-CIO, debating uh, unfolding inequalities in a world in crisis. So do join us 4.30, 20th of June. And thanks everyone for listening. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, go forth and spread the word for a job guarantee. Thank you. Bye-bye.